How are y'all doing today? All right, everybody wake up. We got a lot to talk about tonight. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them once again that they're made in the image of God. Turn to that same person and tell them that I am made in the image of God. We have spent the last three weeks talking about men and women of God and what that means for us as individuals, what that means for us within our marriages, what that means for us um, in, the, in the congregation, in the body of believers. And I realized as we were going through this, this is sort of perfect timing. Some of the songs we sang about tonight touch directly on it. Um, Shavuot is really central to the idea of us being the bride of Christ, of us being the people who God married at Mount Sinai. Um, and so this relationship that we've been discussing on many levels in our human relationships mirrors the relationship that we should have with the Father. It's everything we experience in the physical is a reflection of what should be in the spiritual. It's a pale comparison of what happens in the spiritual. But there's sort of this elephant in the room that we have not yet talked about, or I guess an elephant in Scripture. There are a lot of topics in Scripture that people just don't talk about because they're uncomfortable, because they're socially awkward, because they're strange, because they're unusual, because they're foreign, or maybe we just miss them. But it's, and a lot of y'all have probably experienced this at different times. When you've studied something, all of a sudden you're like, everywhere I turn in the Bible, all I keep reading about is this, whether it's Israel, the Holy Spirit, I mean, all these sorts of things that whatever the topic is, once you address it and you start to look for it, you're like, wow, this really ties everything together. And that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight, is one of these topics that's not often talked about. I've never heard anybody talk about it. Um, but it fits directly into what it means for us as the bride, what it means for us certainly on the human side, but more importantly on the spiritual side. And it's all about what Shavuot is all about. It's the time, historically, when God married his bride at Mount Sinai. It's the time when the Holy Spirit came down in the upper room. It's a pivotal moment. And it's strange because it's sort of this weird summer holiday. We have three really good holidays. Then there's this ambiguous amount of time. Then we have another holiday, which is today, tonight. And then we wait a while, and then we have three more awesome holidays. And so Pentecost always gets overlooked. Um, and I will use those probably interchangeably. Pentecost, Shavuot, same thing. Um, one's Hebrew, one's Greek. But it's the same day. And so a lot of times it's overlooked. Um, a lot of people don't make a big effort for it. They don't uh, go out of their way for it. It's kind of just a normal church service, I guess, if they even do that much. But it's something that, he, that is absolutely pivotal to our identity. And it's funny, even the Pentecostals don't celebrate Pentecost anymore. Um, it's something that just it doesn't even occur to people anymore. Um, but I'm thankful that y'all are here to celebrate it with us. So if you have your Bibles, we're just going to jump right in. We're going to talk about one of these unspeakable topics. Ooh, how exciting. Um, people are just like, John, don't talk about this, don't talk about that. Anytime somebody says, don't talk about something, that means I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> so bear with me and forgive me. So in our Bibles, there's this concept, especially as it pertains to husbands and wives, of them coming together in unity. We've talked about that of them being united in one flesh, of them producing literally one flesh in the life of their children. Um, this idea of fertility and productivity, and it's why Adam and Eve were created. It was to be fruitful and multiply and refill the earth, and all these different things. We read about Noah and everywhere else in Scripture, this common theme. If you have your Bible, we read this a couple of weeks ago, but in Genesis 4.1, it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from Yahweh. That's an interesting statement. <laughs> I got a man from Yahweh, but uh, whatever. Uh, there's this thing of Adam knowing his wife Eve, and that's sort of a euphemism. It's from the Hebrew word yada. Um, a lot of y'all, if you're familiar with the King James English, or if you just like good jokes, you've probably referenced it at times. Um, it's this idea of having knowledge between a marital, within a marital relationship. But that word is so pivotal because it's why... Adam and Eve were created. It's why male and female were created in his image, was for that moment of productivity. So if you have your Bibles, flip again to Exodus 6, and we'll go to verse 2. 
And this is where Yahweh is laying out the case to Moses for why he is going to do what he is going to do. Why this group of slaves is worth being saved. What he is prepared to do on their behalf. And in Exodus 6, verse 2, it says, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. And again, it's the same word, Yada, and he did not make himself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because of the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel. So this is him explaining why he's going to save them. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people. That word take you, who remembers what that means? When it says Adam and Eve, Eve was taken from the side of Adam. It means to marry. It's the Hebrew word lachach. Its first use is in Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve are both created male and female. So God is saying that this is the same thing that he's going to do. I will take you for my people. I will take you in marriage, essentially, for my people. I will be your God, and you shall know, and again we have that same word, for know. That, and the word that actually means because, you will know because I am Yahweh your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession forever, for I am Yahweh. So his entire purpose in freeing the slaves and freeing the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was so that he could bring them out so he could marry them, so he could take them as his bride. Obviously, as New Covenant believers, whatever term you want to identify with, people that have the benefit of the New Testament, we understand the value of our role as the bride as well. But that was his original intent all the way back at Mount Sinai and why he delivered the Israelites from Egypt. He wanted to take them. He wanted to have that knowledge with them. And it's easy in our society to take this, kind of make it crass and make it physical and make it all about us and our human experiences. It's not like that. Our human experiences are just an image of what the Father desires, the intimacy that he desires. Our human experiences are a pale comparison to what he desires. But it was so that he could know them and so that they would know him. That's the whole point. That's still what he wants from us. And so our human marriages, they're the closest mirror we have to the interplay between God and his bride, between our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Marriage is how life is created. The union, the unity that comes from a husband and wife, that is something that produces literally life. This is not rocket science. So we have to understand God's design for marriage and life, and we have to understand that our biology, as we discussed in Genesis, our biology, we're made in the image of God. We're made to reveal God's likeness, to be a reflection of what is godly, to be a picture of what is heavenly. And it's interesting, it's fascinating as you read through Scripture that our bodies reveal God's design and God's plan for creation. And for all you parents who are nervous, this is going to stay PG, don't worry. We'll keep it kosher, i got young kids too. But that is the point. In the Greek, there's the word gnosko. It's the exact same word, it means to know. It's used in the exact same context as the Hebrew version. In Luke 1, verse 34... This is one of the first times in the New Testament that we hear about the Holy Spirit. It says, Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall also be called the Son of God. So what the angel is saying to Mary is that the Holy Spirit will be how, she's saying, I've never known a man. How is this going to be possible? And he's saying the Holy Spirit is how God will know you. You will have knowledge of God through the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that in, if you study this, and I read a lot of, I study a lot of strange and bizarre and probably insignificant things. Um, but the, the reason why in our Bibles the word to know, when it talks about Mary not knowing a man, the reason why it's to know, just for your information, 
is theoretically humans are essentially the basically the only ones of God's creations um, that when they know one another um, actually have a tendency to be face to face. Um, it has a tendency to have a degree of intimacy that you don't see in other creation. That's why throughout thousands and thousands of years, your Bibles, the Hebrew, the Greek, it doesn't matter what it is, that's why they refer to it as someone knowing someone. Because it's the eye contact, it's the face-to-face -face relationship. Which may sound familiar to you. In Matthew 7, verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is Yeshua talking. He says, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name or in your authority and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. It's the exact same word. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, you who forsake the Torah. So there is something to it, and I think we all recognize this, and those of us who hopefully I'm going to... I'm going to lead with the assumption that you have a relationship with the Father. If you don't, we'd love to talk to you about it afterward. <laughs> but the whole point is having a knowledgeable relationship with the Father, having an intimate relationship. Our salvation comes from that. It is essential and it's imperative to our faith and to our eternal life and to our, the promises and blessings of God that He and we know one another. That we have that level of intimacy. And again, it's not physical. It's spiritual. It's emotional. It's cosmic. Whatever term you want to use. But don't get weirded out by it. And so our, it's our spiritual intimacy through the Holy Spirit that enables us to know Yeshua, to know the Father. That's something that this day, this coming day, more than ever, I think, is utterly important to us to understand. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12 says, For now we see only reflection as in a mirror, and remember, this idea of a mirror, husband and wife, created in the image of, one, of God, reflections. It says, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And this is something we see common throughout Scripture. It talks about God meeting face to face with people. And really only a select number of people in Scripture have that distinction. Moses, God spoke with face to face doesn't mean they actually were face to face. No one has ever seen God. Scripture's clear about that. But they had that same level of spiritual intimacy, same level of purpose, of understanding that we see reflected in a healthy marriage. And so it's important to understand that our marriages, our intimacy, our relationships with our husbands and wives are the closest reflection we will ever have in this lifetime of the relationship the Father wants from us. And so the question we always need to ask ourselves is, do we have an intimate relationship with God? For you, it's a yes or no question. You don't have to say it out loud, but think it. It's got to be one or the other. Do you have an intimate relationship with the Father? Do you feel empowered? Do you have knowledge of God, of His heart, of His intentions? Are you empowered by the Spirit? And if the answer is kind of, or I hope so, then your answer is no. That's what this day is all about, is us and God's people having a relationship, being an intimately connected in a covenant that stretches throughout all eternity between humanity and the God of the universe. And again, it has absolutely nothing to do with what we experience physically. It's the last time I'm going to say this. But God is not a man. We, scripture says that. <laughs> People always talk about you know, the, what God is or isn't. He, he doesn't have a physical human body like we do. Do you think God has a belly button? No, probably not. <laughs> uh, he's not a man. But we're talking about spiritual and emotional intimacy. And so on the day of Pentecost, on the day of Shavuot, at Mount Sinai, so God does all of this. He brings the Israelites out of Egypt. He frees them from bondage. He drags them into the wilderness through the sea, washing them, literally baptizing them through the sea. They rise on the other side. They stand in front of Mount Sinai. He says, wash yourselves, bathe yourselves, prepare yourselves, cleanse the camp. 
etc. And then stand before the mountain, all of God's people together. And at that moment, they essentially said their vows. He offered them essentially a, an abridged version of the Ten Commandments. And it says, and all Israel said, I do. After that, they got scared. But in that moment, they agreed to it. Then they sent Moses up on their behalf. It's interesting that then they fell into sin, as we know, with the golden calf. Um, even in our own marriages, in our own lives, even when we have great commitments, even when we have covenants, there are sometimes shortcomings that occur. And even despite that, God remarried Israel with the re-signing of the Ten Commandments. But through that incident, 3,000 people were killed. So the covenant was something God took very seriously with the golden calf. And then because of that, that actually started the whole idea of the tabernacle and the priesthood and all these extra layers that God essentially implemented because the people had fallen. The priesthood didn't exist from day one when they came out of Egypt. And then thousands of years later in the upper room, the Holy Spirit comes down and empowers the bride, just like the Holy Spirit came down and knew Mary. And we see in that story, on that day, 3,000 people were restored back to the body. So God is always in the business of restoration. He's always in the business of life. What's been taken will be restored through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's the groundwork. That's the day that we're facing. And it's interesting. We, we talk a lot about Passover. We talk a lot about the resurrection. We talk a lot about you know, various holidays, various feasts. Without this one, the rest is sort of meaningless. This is where the covenant began. This is where the Holy Spirit comes into play. This is where the empowerment, it's both where it begins as well as where it pushes forward, where it ends. It's fundamental to who we are. And again, it's all reflected in creation. It's all reflected in the way the Father created our bodies and the way he created our marriages and the way his design for the universe should be. So recapping, what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, was Eve taken from the rib of Adam? No, she was taken from the side of Adam. The word rib is not in your Bible in the original Hebrew. It does not refer to a piece of anatomy or a piece of flesh anywhere else in your Bible. What it does refer to is a side. And 40 times, which I think is a convenient number, and only once does it refer to a hillside, 40 times, the other 40 times, when that word is used, it refers to structures of either Eve and her creation or structures of the temple and the tabernacle the vast majority of the times. It's talking about the ark. It's talking about the coverings. It's talking about the things that God used for his worship to reveal himself, to have a relationship with God. That's the part of humanity that was made in God's image that was crafted out and set aside as the wife. Which is interesting, because that didn't make it into our storybooks. We thought Adam was walking around without a rib, <laughs> even though the Bible doesn't say that. So the key is that then we have this idea of this biological mirror to what it is that we experience, to what it is our relationship with the Father should be. We're made in the image of God. It's got to mean something. And I want to just say that biology is our key to understanding so much of what we do. We talk about the feasts all the time. We talk about the new moon cycles. We talk about the tabernacle. We talk about the temple. We talk about so many different things, especially in our world. And the elephant in the room, well, you'll see. If we look at the tabernacle, again, the same word, the sides of the tabernacle, is the same thing that was used to describe Eve and what she was created from. You have essentially, if you think about how it's laid out, you've all seen the charts, who's seen it, who, knows, who has a general idea of what the tabernacle looks like? Who's been to the tabernacle experience? Where are my maze at? Yeah. So essentially what you do is you have a curtain, you have a barrier. Once you get beyond that first curtain, you then have a courtyard. Within that courtyard, you have an altar and you have a bowl, a basin of water. So you have blood and you have water in the courtyard. You then have another veil. You have the barrier to the actual interior, the interior of the, the tent of meeting. Within that tent of meeting, you have the first room, essentially, is called the holy place. 
And there you have the table of showbread, you have the lampstand, the menorah, and you have the altar of incense. Those three things, bread, incense, and fire, representing the body, mind, and spirit, where the Israel, the priests would come and bring forth the Israelites' gifts and their relationship and everything that they had, their expressions of worship to the Father, would be brought into that tabernacle, into the holy place. Beyond there, it's also called the tent of meeting. That's where Abraham, Abraham Moses, um, this idea of them communing with God was something that always existed. And so this sort of became the codified place where that would occur. Beyond that, you have another veil, the veil that was torn when Yeshua was crucified. And then you enter into the holy place. Within the holy place is the Ark of the Covenant and what we call the mercy seat. It is the place, and a lot of you all are probably familiar with how the temple services operated, what's, what took place on what days, and a lot of you are probably already connecting the dots, and a lot of you all are probably already uncomfortable. But the entire structure of the tabernacle is a diagram of a mother's body, literally. And it's interesting that within that holy place, within the Ark of the Covenant, there is only one time a year when a person is allowed to enter into that ark, enter and approach the ark. The high priest, what day was that on? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Once a year. Galatians 3.29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The word seed literally in Greek is sperma, which literally means what you think it means. This idea that once a year and only once a year was a literally a seed of Abraham, a person, was able to enter beyond the veils, through the courtyard, into the Holy of Holies and bring life and bring atonement and bring sanctification on behalf of the people. The mercy seat was where God lived, where he dwelled, where his spirit dwelled. A lot of y'all are still skeptical. You're like, whatever, this is weird. And I get it, because it is weird. No one talks about it. On top of the ark, or on top of the tabernacle even, the entire covering, how many layers were on top of the covering of the tabernacle? Four, that's right. Not all at once now. The top skin was a badger skin, which essentially was a skin. Beneath that was... Ram skins dyed red. So you had this red sort of leather structure underneath that. Beneath that was this woven goat hair. And then beneath that was the, the linen covering that actually was seen from underneath. It's interesting. How many of y'all have ever had a C-section or been in the room when one has occurred? I have. How many layers do you think the surgeon cuts through to get to the baby? Four. Essentially, you have skin. You have skin. You have the abdomen, the red, the muscle. You then have the fascia, which is literally described in your medical literature as fibrous tissue, which is directly relates to the woven goat hair. And then you have the actual uterus itself, the womb, which is represented by the purity of the linen. So even all throughout this process, it's this continual picture of life. The feast, our cycle, the, the, the way the world works was all part of God's cosmic plan. And yes, it is all a symbol of the womb. It is the place where God would know his people. Why do you think it is that Satan wars against women's bodies? Whether it's abortion, whether it's degradation, whether it's, you know, you name it. Why is it so important to Satan? Because it's important to God, because it is where life begins. It's the closest picture we have in our physical to what happens in the spiritual. 
the Hebrew word for mercy is the same word for raham. The same word raham. It means womb. When God talks about his mercy, what he's literally saying, he's talking about his womb. Because there is a ton, there's a kind of nurturing compassion that only a mother can understand when it comes towards her children. That is what God's mercy is like. And no wonder in the very middle of it all we have what we call the mercy seat. And so it's the symbol. The tabernacle itself is the symbol of this unity that the Father desires. It's this place that three times a year the people of God would come together where the offerings would be brought in, where all of God's people would have this purity and this intimate relationship with Him, where His presence literally descended, where the joy was just filled the place, where life was given to the people. And then we see later on that this tabernacle becomes a temple, we are later described as the temple. And the temple itself is also in Revelation described as being the bride. Literally, the temple, a building, the same structures that we just described, is described as being the bride. Coming down out of heaven like a bride. We're also the temple. We understand that. So we are also that bride. We are the place where the Holy Spirit dwells, where eternal life can be created through the Holy Spirit. I said a couple weeks ago that in order for me to be a good husband, in order for me to be a good man, I have to first learn how to be a good bride. And that's true for every single person here. Understanding our relationship with the Father should determine how we conduct every other relationship in our lives. It may seem unusual. It may seem strange a little bit on our weird biological, you know, human outlook. But it's the reality that God is seeking. So that's one hand. So we have this tabernacle, and that's sweet and cool, and some of y'all are buying it, and some of y'all are skeptical. That's what I love about you kind of people. You're very skeptical. You've got to give them lots of facts. Let's look at the feast cycles. I believe they're symbols of God's relationship to Israel. And we talk about this every feast when it come around. We talk about what it means, what Passover means for our spiritual deliverance. All of the feasts of Israel are set around the moon cycle. Well, I guess if you're a flat earther, it's probably more like this. But, uh, but if, if, if you're not, then you know the, the world's spinning and the moon's floating around. And um, Regardless, everything we read about in Scripture about the feasts has to do with the new moons. That's how the months are determined in Scripture. That's how the months were set up. So Passover, Shavuot, everything hinges on these days and how they relate to this cycle of the moon. The moon is on a 28-day cycle. Every new moon, there would be sacrifices, there would be bloodshed in the temple. It was symbolic of a fresh start, a new beginning um, for the people of Israel, as well as just in the natural. The moon literally would sort of re-begin to grow. And so we don't need to answer this out loud, and if you don't know, your wife can explain it to you, but there's other things in creation that also operate on a 28-day cycle. But that's how the feasts were set up. So in the fall feasts, we know, and we talk about this all the time, they represent the return of Yeshua, the return of the Messiah. We have trumpets, Yom Teruah, which we celebrate in the park. Um, that's where I found out David and Natalie were having a baby. It's kind of ironic, given our today's topic. But that's the sound of the trumpet, the blast, the return of the bridegroom. The last trump, if you will. It's this holiday where they blow trumpets and celebrate the return on sort of this unknown day in history. Because we don't know exactly which day the new moon's going to be. It's either going to be Monday or Tuesday. or you know, Depends on the week. Depends on the year. Then we have on the tail end of the fall feast, we have Sukkot, we have tabernacles, which represents, it's a, essentially a seven or eight day holiday, depending on how you render it. And it represents the marriage supper of the lamb. In Jewish wedding customs, the marriage supper would occur after the wedding. And then it would be essentially a week long holiday, big party. Everybody in town would come, they'd have a big party. It's sort of like you had to do your honeymoon with everybody else. Kind of weird, but that's what they were into. And that's what we see reflected in Sukkot, and Tabernacles. It's after Yeshua returns to earth and we're once again reunited with our bridegroom, we are going to experience the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's what that symbolizes. But what is in between those two holidays? 
atonement. Yom Kippur, that one magical day when one single seed of Abraham was able to enter into the holy place and not die. In the wedding customs, when the bridegroom returns, comes and picks up his bride, then we get to the end and they have a wedding party that lasts all week long. There is something that happens in between. The wedding night, essentially. The consummation of the covenant. And that's what Yom Kippur is. It's the time when our atonement, when our eternal life is given, when our relationship with the Father is consecrated and sanctified and set apart for Him. It's the time when Israel's relationship and their atonement was received in the tabernacle. And so we have this cycle of life that occurs in this tabernacle, in this temple, in, the, in us, the temple. The cycle that as you get on it, as you continue to go through the feasts, every year you experience more and more revelation. You get more of an identity. That intimacy with the Father grows. So if this is your first year and this all sounds Greek to you, I'm sorry. Just stick with it. It makes more sense as you go. So if we look at the cycle of life, At the Feast of Trumpets, that is essentially the new moon. So we have a new moon, fall feast, we blow the trumpets, the bridegroom arrives. It's the beginning, it's a new moon. There then, if you're going to interpret this sort of biologically, scripturally, there would then be seven days of separation between a husband and a wife, if that was the new moon, if you catch my drift. Yom Kippur happens on the tenth day which is actually the moment um, in biology that would be the sort of the beginning of the window for peak fertility if you're looking at the 10th day of a human. That's when the covenant was consummated. That's when the atonement is found. We then settle into the marriage supper of the Lamb, the celebration of the covenant, the after party, if you will, at Sukkot. When we get to Hanukkah, it's interesting that we have two holidays that are not necessarily dictated by God, but they both occur. They both have one thing in common. They're times when the enemies of God sought to destroy the seed of God. The Hanukkah, first trimester, concludes, second trimester begins. Purim, second trimester ends, third trimester begins. In both of those cases, Abraham tried to, or Satan tried to kill the seed of Abraham, annihilate them. We then get to Shavuot, so we go through the Spring Feast, and then we arrive at where we are today. It's interesting how it matches up, because we have this random summer holiday that we count to, count to the Omer, count to 50, a random moment in time that we anticipate, that we build up to. But the reality is that even in your own life, if you had conceived a child on Yom Kippur, last Yom Kippur, literally, it could be birthed tonight and be full term. It's the, the nine months, it's not really nine months, it's actually 37 weeks, and it's not actually from the moment of conception, it's from the moment of the last, from trumpets, you talk to your OBGYN about it. <laughs> But you could be full term at this point. Which then makes us wonder the spiritual implications of it. We went through Yom Kippur. We shared that experience together. What was conceived then? In your life, in our lives, in the spiritual realm, whatever term you want to use. And what is it that we have to look forward to being delivered tonight? In the biblical um, birthing customs, if you have a male child, you're required, the husband and wife are essentially required to remain apart for 40 days. If there is a female child, they're required to remain apart for 80 days. Why? The Bible doesn't necessarily say. But it is interesting that if you, in the, in the biology of a female child, you're, a female, when a female is born, it's actually two generations. 
because she's born with all of her eggs that will become her children. So it's kind of strange. The egg that made you was actually in your grandmother. Um, so grandmas, you've got a big role to play. Um, but there is sort of this double blessing that two generations are revealed at once, even though one is yet to be born um, and when that happens. So, but we have this weird time of like 80 days. So if tomorrow is the birth, what's the next holiday? Trumpets. The next literal feast day is trumpets. If we took 80 days off and then waited until the conclusion or until the next new moon, that puts us at 80 days. When we get back to Yom Kippur again, it's peak fertility. You know, so theoretically, the way this whole thing is engineered by God is that at even human peak fertility, if you followed all the biblical customs for husbands and wives and how they should relate to each other and their timetables and all this stuff, you could actually produce a child every year on the feast cycle like clockwork, which is exactly what happens in the spiritual world. And it's interesting that this 80 days plus the change, is for what is expected when something feminine is delivered, something with a feminine quality to it. So if we think back historically to this day in history, what happened on those days? And I think there's a few different ways you can slice and dice this. First, the Torah was given on Mount Sinai, the commandments, the covenant. The word Torah is actually a feminine noun in Hebrew. It's a feminine word. There's a certain femininity to it. I don't understand it. It's not the same as our biological femininity, but it's there. It's also the day when God married his bride. So if nothing else, we've got sort of the revelation of the bride on that day. The word Shekinah, which a lot of your Pentecostals like to talk about, the Jews like to talk about it, or doxa is the, sort of the Greek version of it. It's also a feminine noun for the presence of God. The Ruach, the spirit, is again a feminine noun. It was given on the, in the upper room, second chapter of Acts. It's not to say the Holy Spirit's a woman. The Holy Spirit's a spirit. It's not a man or a woman. <laughs> but there is something to it. And if nothing else, that was when the bride was empowered in the upper room. John 4, verse 24 says, But a time is coming, and now has come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. And then Psalm 119, verse 160, it says, All your word is truth. Your righteous laws are eternal. What the Father is seeking from each and every one of us, what he wants from his bride, is this combination of spirit and truth. The truth being the, his word, the commandments, the Torah. These are the two things that were given on the day of Shavuot to his people. They're the two things that we should be embracing as part of our identity. Shavuot is the first fruits of the wheat harvest, like I mentioned earlier. The heart, wheat would be harvested in, they'd celebrate a holiday. It represents the fruitfulness of humanity. Wheat generally is something that in scripture refers to humanity. And so we're for celebrating the harvest of humanity on this day in history. Maybe there's something to it. And so Shavuot, this holiday that we are about to celebrate, is this day in which two things with a degree of femininity associated with them were delivered and brought forth. The Spirit and the Word of God. How many chromosomes does it take to create a bride, to create a female. It creates two. One comes from the father, one comes from the mother. They are both feminine chromosomes. It takes two feminine things to make a feminine thing. And even that feminine thing comes from a masculine thing. This is endless interplay. It's this idea, and what I want to encourage you to embrace is this idea that the spirit and truth together are what make us the bride. 
It's not enough just to have the Spirit. It's not enough just to have the truth. If you think you only have one without the other, you probably actually have nothing. We have to embrace both parts of it, and that's what this day is all about. It's all about the intimacy that we have with the Father. It's all about the life given at Yom Kippur. It's all about the atonement. This day in history, when spirit and truth are delivered, this is the time when our atonement comes to fruition. This is when the baby is born. So I want to focus tonight on the promises of Shavuot. As we worship, as we pray, what it means for you individually, what it means for us as a church, what it means for our nation, your children, on every level. And it's not going to be the same for everybody. But what are the promises of Shavuot for your life? What are the promises of the Spirit and truth? What are the promises of this cycle, this fruitfulness that was prophesied in Genesis? I think one of them is that we, have, we can rest assured that our intimacy with God will bear fruit. If you're not seeing fruit or if you're not feeling like you have an intimate relationship with the Father, that's probably a good place to start. But when you have it, it will bear fruit. Your atonement should bear fruit in your life. Spirit and truth. And I think for those of us who strive to embrace both the Torah and the Spirit and sort of the continuity of Scripture, we are blessed with this tremendous gift of being able, I think, in this context to better understand our identity as the bride. But then we have a choice. Is that an identity we're going to embrace or an identity we're going to run from? Are these promises we're going to pursue Is this fruit we're willing to bear or not? And as I was praying about this, and this is something the Father's been revealing to me over the last several months, but as I was praying about what this means for us as a congregation, I do feel like the Father spoke to me. And what I heard him saying over and over again is that what was conceived at Yom Kippur would be delivered tomorrow, tonight. And I know at our Yom Kippur, one thing that Nathan, I believe, was asked is that we would ask the Father to speak to each and every one of us. Some of y'all were there. Some of y'all may not have been, but we're all there in spirit. And I know the Father spoke to me that night. I didn't know what it means. I still don't know exactly what it means. But I feel like the message for tonight is that what was conceived then is going to be delivered tonight and tomorrow. God is ready to reveal his blessings. He is ready for those spiritual babies to be born. (laughs) He is ready for the goodness, for the fruitfulness that he has designed for you to come forth. What it takes for us is for us to recognize our role as his bride, for us to have that intimacy, for us to be in that relationship. You don't get fruitfulness without intimacy, biologically. And I don't think you do spiritually either. If you have that, share it. Be encouraged. Look forward to it. Hold fast to the promises of God. There are blessings coming. And if you don't have it, pursue it. It is like a marriage. You do have to make a covenant with God. It is a conscious decision. But if you make that decision, you open yourself up to an intimate relationship with him. God isn't interested in a casual partner. He's not interested in friends with benefits. He wants a bride. So if all you want are the blessings, the benefits, the feel-goods, but aren't willing to make the commitment, it's probably never going to happen. And I think as we get there tonight, and if the band wants to come and get ready, that's great. I can wrap it up. We need to embrace what we see in Mount Sinai. 
what we saw in the upper room. It was all of God's people together, men, women, foreigners, everybody, standing together before him as his bride, with absolute surrender, willing to say that whatever you have for us, we are willing to accept, to say I do, to be in agreement in one accord, in unity, and I think above all, desiring a relationship with him. If we can push for that in our own lives, in the lives of one another, that's all he wants. He can work with that. But we have to want it. We have to desire it. The same way if you were trying to have a human relationship. Your desire matters. And it's reciprocated.